Well, welcome everyone to What's New in AMA 11th edition. The AMA stands for the American Medical Association, and AMA style is primarily used by medical and health science fields. So we're going to talk a bit about AMA style and how it differs from other styles. And then we'll review the elements of AMA papers. And as I do that, I'm going to try to point out any substantive differences between the 10th edition and the 11th edition, which is the most current. Uh, finally, I'm going to go live towards the end so I can show you the AMA manual style online. And if there's time, I'll point out a few supplementary AMA resources. Um, so please, if, any, if you have questions at any point, please throw them in the chat or you can just um, uh, mute and ask your question. But first, let me just touch upon a couple of basics. Why are we citing in the first place? Uh, the primary goal is to give creators credit for their work. Now, style manuals don't always cover every single example that you might encounter when you're writing a paper or an article, and sometimes that can be really stressful. So try to find the best example that you can in the citation manual to support your choices. And remember to err on the side of giving the creator or the author credit, and make sure you provide enough information so that the viewer can find the work. So if the primary goal for citing is attribution and discovery, why are there so many different publication styles? Well, publication styles provide consensus and guidelines for writers on how to present their information. Disciplines will choose styles based on the information that's important to them and what they wanna highlight. For example, the MLA, the Modern Language Association, that's used in literary fields and other subjects in the humanities where there are lots of direct quotes. Their citation style lets you see the author and cite page numbers without interrupting the flow of discussion. And then the references are listed at the end of the paper in author order. The APA uses an author date system for citation, and that allows you to see immediately who's being cited and the currency of the study. References are also listed alphabetically by author. On the other hand, the AMA uses these superscripts for their in-text citations. And like MLA, it lets you move quickly through the text, but unlike MLA, the references are in a list by order of appearance. I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. So then which style should you actually choose? Um, basically you choose whatever your professor tells you to use, but if your professor is flexible about what style to use, you can choose the style of your choice. I recommend that you use a style frequently so it becomes second nature. So it's probably a good idea to find the style that's used in your discipline so that when you're using it frequently, it'll become second nature to you. Now, if you're writing to publish, that's a different story altogether. You wanna use the style of your target journal. So for example, the journal of the Academy of Nutrition and Dietetics uses AMA. So you use that style if you were publishing in their journal. You can typically find the style a publisher uses on their website in the instruction for author section. Whatever you pick, make sure you're using the same style and the same version throughout your document. So back to AMA style. Um, the new edition of the AMA Manual of Style was published in 2020 by the JAMA Network. And the publishers state that almost every chapter was edited in some fashion. So for example, the statistics chapter was rewritten to help people who don't have strong statistical backgrounds like me. But more than 200 pages were added to the 11th edition, including many more examples of reporting guidance for study types, information on data display, authorship, and graphs. If you've used another publication style, the AMA manual may seem to be a bit vague when it comes to writing term papers or classroom projects, and your perception will be correct. The manual is primarily designed to support authors publishing in journals. So it doesn't include sample student papers or focus on elements for classroom use. Now, although 
the AMA does not contain a lot of formatting details. In general, the pages should have the following in accordance with JAMA. So you wanna have those one inch margins, um, double space your text, left justify paragraphs, and you indent the first paragraph by about a half an inch. Um, you keep your right margins, I think they call that ragged, so they're unjustified. And typically those papers use a font that's about 10 to 12 points, but they don't actually specify in the AMA manual what font style to use. If you do have questions about format or abstracts, layout or other specific areas for your assignment, you wanna consult with your instructor. The AMA style does have standard document elements, and those are the title, the abstract, the main body or text, and then references. And I'll briefly address each of these areas. Some publishers require a title page, not all, but some do. And the AMA manual style, again, it doesn't specify a font size or font types for title pages but they do offer recommendations for content. So typically you would include the title of your paper and that's followed by the author's name. Um, you give the complete name with the highest degree that they've achieved listed or however the publisher specifies. And then you follow that by author's notes. So that includes things like author affiliations, um, which would be if you're a professional would be where you're, you're working. As a student, it could very well be your university. So you might put Drexel University, possibly the course that you're taking and the date. Again, you wanna check with your instructor about that. And a word count. Word counts aren't always used in student papers. So that's somewhat variable, as well as this short title header. Keep in mind, if you're used to APA, it's not just a shortened version of the title. Um, it emphasizes the main points of the article, but it's just fewer words. Your title's followed by an abstract, and the abstract can be located on your title page, or it can start on the second page. And you wanna center and boldface the word abstract. Now, abstracts can be structured or they can be unstructured. And the structured abstracts are typically used for reports that have original data, systematic reviews, or clinical reviews. They don't have to include headers, but typically they have headings that cover things like the study objective or importance, the study design and methods, primary results, and principal conclusions. But again, the heading style is probably going to be pay, uh, based on what the publisher requests. Usually they're under 350 words. And I think that that's a, um, a JAMA criteria because I've actually seen them listed as lower than 300 words. Your unstructured abstracts are typically not used for reports with original data, they're used for everything else if an abstract is required. Normally they're not more than 200 words and they summarize the objective or main points and conclusion of the article. After your abstract, some publishers also ask that you uh, provide a list of eight or 10 keywords that address the, the document's primary concepts, but not always. The main body and text is another element of uh, AMA reports. And studies are usually divided into introductions, methodology, results, and discussion categories, even if they don't, aren't explicitly used as headings. Headings and subheadings are used to break up the order of a document and to make it easier for you to read. So you'd only bother using headings if you had multiple headings, usually at least two or three. AMA doesn't specify formats for headings either, but make sure when you choose a format that you're consistent throughout the document. 
The body text section is also where you're going to find in-text citations. And the role of the in-text citation is to immediately give attribution to the author whenever you're quoting or you're paraphrasing their work. Reference pages will then tell you where to find that work. Whenever you're using the words or ideas or images of other researchers, you need to uh, provide some type of a credit in the text and reference list for that work. Now I state here that you don't cite common knowledge or original thoughts. A common knowledge is information that most people already know, like Barack Obama was president of the United States or water freezes at 32 degrees. The tricky thing is that what's common knowledge can vary somewhat based on your audience. It can also be a challenge to recognize what's an original thought, especially if you've been researching an area for some time. You may not be sure, is this my original thought or is this something I came across in a reading? So I would say if you're in doubt, go ahead and cite it. Let your professor or instructor tell you you didn't need to cite that. This is an example from an actual article in a journal that uses AMA. And as you can see here, it uses these superscripts uh, for uh, citing resources. The superscripts denote the in-text citations. And again, as I mentioned earlier, this allows you to just read through this information without getting bogged down with author names. If you wanna reference multiple sources in a citation, just put a comma in between those sources, or you can use a dash if you are referencing uh, more than two references that are uh, one after the other in a list, if they appear sequentially. So for example, if I had three references that I wanted to cite, I could just put one dash three here, as long as they appear sequentially in my reference list. You wanna put the superscript on the outside of the period. If you were going to reuse the same reference, so let's say three paragraphs down, I wanted to cite this reference again, I would just use the same number. Now, typically you're not doing a whole lot of direct quotes in your papers, but if you do, you need to reference the page number. And when you're referencing the page number, you just put it in parentheses next to the superscript. Here is an example here. So I'm gonna move from in-text citations now to the actual reference. And each reference is listed in order of usage. Every time you use that reference, you cite it in text using the same reference number. When you create your reference list, put it on a new page in your document. Just call it references and the reference list should be double spaced. The number of citations in your list of references has to match the number of in-text citations in your document. So that's something that you wanna check before you turn your paper in. Different types of references have different formats, but there's a minimum acceptable amount of data for each references, for each reference, excuse me. So here's an example for print and online journal articles print and online books and websites. The type of information that is the minimal acceptable amount really depends on the source material. Now this is just a summary. So you wanna make sure you consult the manual style chapter on whatever specific form you're looking for. That'll give you the complete requirements. But I'm going to review a few reference examples here. This is for journals. Journals should have at a minimum author, article title, journal title, and so on. And here's an example below. So the article title 
notice it's in sentence case. And that means that only certain things should be capitalized here. It's kind of like with APA. So the first word within the article title, any proper nouns, if there's a subtitle, the first word in that subtitle, and that's it. Oh, also, if you have abbreviations that are normally capitalized, they would appear capital here, but everything else should be lowercase. On the other hand, this is the title of the journal, and journal titles are in all caps. They're also abbreviated. And if you're not sure what abbreviation to use for your journal, that's not a problem. Um, you can look it up in the National Library of Medicine catalog. I made sure that I included a link to that in our resource list. This is a DOI. And DOI stand for Digital Object Identifiers. There are persistent links. And since they don't change over time, it makes it a lot easier to find an article if you have a DOI for it. So please, if you've got one, make sure that you include it. You just record the letters DOI in lowercase, and then any characters that are part of that DOI. Now, this is something that is a little bit different in the um, 11th edition. You don't bother putting a period at the end of the DOI um, because they were the, the publishers found that typically people cut and paste these things. No one types this out. And it was causing a lot of problems with linking because they were including the period. So now they just tell you in the 11th edition, don't even bother including a period at the end of the DOI. But if you have one, make sure you include it. For authors, if you have one to six authors, list all the authors. For more than six, you just list the first three and include the term et al. And one difference between um, citing authors in, let's say, uh, APA versus AMA is there's no punctuation between the author's last name and the first initial, which looks a little naked to me because I'm used to using APA. But the only thing you do is use commas to just separate the individual authors, no punctuation within the author's names. For books, you wanna italicize the name of the book and then you capitalize all pertinent uh, words. If it's the first edition, you don't bother to indicate that. But one thing that's different between the 10th and 11th edition, the new edition, is that you don't include the place of publication, okay, which is sort of like AP. I think they stopped doing that as well. Their main reason was that knowing the location of, of publication doesn't really help you retrieve the item. So you no longer have to include that. There are a few unique elements for web page references. If the date published or the date updated are available, include it. I didn't have a date published, so I don't have that in this reference. But you also want to include the date that you access the web pages with the idea that web pages can change with some frequency, so you want to know when it was accessed. If you have a URL, make sure you include the URL. One thing that's changed again in the 11th edition is that the location of the URL moved. I think it used to be after the web page title. Now it's at the very end. Same reasoning, people usually cut and paste this. So putting it at the end of the citation or reference, excuse me, will give you easy access. So now I just want to mention a few items that weren't necessarily changed or updated in a new manual, but they were additions to the manual. It includes things like how to reference preprints and manuscripts and repositories. So you just note the word preprint when it was posted. And if there is a uh, repository number, include that as well as the DOI. There is a lot more information and guidance on tables and figures. Um, in this example, they suggest you don't use 
complex pie charts. They're really easy to manipulate visually. Instead, they recommend using bar graphs. Lots of additional information on how to cite social media and changes in style mechanics for e-words. So things like email, no longer hyphenated, but for some reason they decide to hyphenate ebook still, not quite sure why, but that's their, that's their rule. And then for words that involve the web, like website, webcast, web page, they are all one word now. Finally, I think one of the more important changes addresses terminology. So like APA, the AMA encourages the singular they and their, and their pronouns. You want to use they as a generic third person singular pro pronoun, excuse me, to refer to a person whose gender is unknown, but also to refer to a person who uses they as their preferred pronoun. The AMA also encourages the use of bias-free and judgment-free terminology. So I chose this case, um, for example, with addiction. So you wouldn't use alcoholic, addict, or user, but instead people with um, an alcohol addiction or people with an opiate addiction and so on. With, jumped ahead, socioeconomic status, Avoid labeling people with their socioeconomic status. So phrases such as the poor or the unemployed should be avoided, but instead um, resource limited, resource poor are preferred. And then terms um, referring to first and third world or developed and developing countries aren't recommended as descriptors when you're comparing countries or regions. The library has online copies of the AMA Manual of Style, and they're free to you as members of the Drexel community. There's also some other free supplementary tools that you can use. Um, the people who publish AMA have a Twitter account. If, if you have questions, you can submit them to Twitter. They also have an insider blog, and that blog has twice monthly updates because they're constantly updating the manual, even though it's been published. I'm just going to hop on here real quick because I want to show you how you can search in the AMA manual style. You can always get to the manual through drag and search. Just search for the title AMA manual of style and you will see this as one of the options that you can choose. So when you click on the link for the manual of style, there are a couple of ways that you can search it. Notice though that this box here that says Drexel University. If you just Google AMA manual style and try to link into it, you're not going to be able to get down into the different chapters. So make sure you go through the library's website for access. You can either search for information or you can browse. I'm gonna do a quick search here on the term webinar. So let's say I wanted to know how I would go about creating a reference for this webinar. It's going to find every occurrence of the word webinar within the document. If I click on the heading here for conference proceedings online webinars and other presentations, I can just scroll through the document and here they've highlighted the term I searched in red and it tells me what the format would be for citing a webinar. Alternatively, I'm gonna click on this heading here. I can also browse the style manual. To do that, I just click on the AMA manual style header. It's gonna give me a table of contents. A lot of times students are looking through chapter two and three, um, chapter two, covers formatting for different areas. And chapter three is where I would find out how to create in-text references and, excuse me, in-text citations and references. So very basic overview of how you can use this manual. So let me go back and wrap up.
Okay, so we've discussed citation styles in general. We gave you an overview of AMA elements, in-text citation and reference guides, some of the changes and additions to the style manual, and some additional resources that you can use to get more information on how to cite an AMA. And I've listed a number of references and resources here and their links if you need additional information. Of course, you can always contact me. Um, we have a citation style guide under this link, or you can use chat on our library website.